Morning class, today's topic is groundwater. Now, you really can't see it, uh, but it's super important. So I'm gonna go through some of the definitions uh, related to groundwater, and then we'll talk about porosity and permeability, and um, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of groundwater by the time we're done. So let's go through and take a look at the picture that we have here. So groundwater is any water that fills up the pore spaces beneath our surface. And we've got lots of different uh, underground surfaces. Here in Southern California, we've got a tremendous amount of sand and gravel. And uh, those little openings get filled with water. Now, if they're filled with water, it's considered a zone of saturation. Now, when those little openings in the ground are filled with air, it's considered the zone of aeration. So the top of the groundwater is called the water table. And you can see it sort of along here. It's that boundary between the zone of saturation and the zone of aeration. Underneath the ground, we also have, you know, different igneous structures that lead to occlusions, and we've got uh, layers of clay, and it acts to stop the water. And so you see here, the term is aqua tarred. So this is a layer of clay, and water that percolates down from a rain is going to come on top of that. So that water table is above the normal water table, so it's called a perched water table. You can also see that the clay layer extends all the way to the surface, and so then water comes out and that would be considered a spring. And then the last term I want to mention uh, here is what's called a well. Anytime you drill down into the ground and you hit the water table, you can use a pump and pull that water out, and again that is called a well. Well, your water table is going to be evident in a couple places. One, whenever there's a river, you know the water table is at the surface. Uh, in addition, uh, whenever there's a lake, or for example, if you go to the ocean and uh, you're right next to the ocean and you're digging down into the sand, you could go down to the water table of that area. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about how groundwater moves. Well, just like streams, uh, groundwater moves under the influence of gravity. So it's gonna flow from a higher elevation to that of a lower elevation. And like I mentioned, the water table is gonna be observable uh, whenever there's water at the surface. So a lake represents the water table, a wetland represents the water table, and the movement again is from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. And ultimately it's gonna stop somewhere and uh, for the vast majority of our planet, water that is in the ground flows back into the ocean. So the term aquifer is a term that represents what the water is sitting in. And if it's like sand, uh, that's all roughly the same particle size, is going to be able to hold a lot of water on the outside of that round uh, sand particle. Now, if you have rock that's highly broken up and fractured, uh, like possibly an older basalt, which is here, you can have water in those different cracks. And again, that could possibly make for a good aquifer. And then you can also have soil uh, that is an, a little bit of a mixture, but not too good of a mixture, that has larger particles. Because uh, again, a larger particle would maybe lead to larger openings. Uh, and in those openings, you could have uh, water. And again, you drill down into those aquifers and then you uh, extract the water. Here in Southern California, a lot of our top aquifers uh, ultimately have pollutants. That would be from zero uh, to maybe 50 feet below the surface. But we've got a couple really good aquifers at like 300 feet and then 500 feet. But if you're in like Palm Springs, uh, some of the best aquifers are close to 500 feet down. And uh, you need a pretty uh, big opening and a large drill to make that happen. But that's what could make a really good aquifer. Let's talk about a little bit of the specifics of uh, those aquifers. Um, the first one is we take a look at springs. Uh, a spring is an indicator, one, of a good aquifer, uh, two, of having somewhat of a perched uh, water table. And uh, although it's good to take water uh, where you can get it out of the ground, uh, you probably want to skip going into a perched aquifer and then really go into uh, the regular groundwater system if you're going to be drilling well. 
So there are two key terms when describing a good aquifer and just groundwater terminology. The first one is permeability. Permeability is a measure of how fast the water is moving through the ground. So it's the rate of groundwater. Now, if you have big openings like gravel, you're gonna have a high permeability. If you have clay with the particles super small, water is not going to go through it, so that would be a poor permeability. Sand uh, has a moderate permeability. So when you're looking at groundwater flow and where you want to sort of drill to get groundwater, permeability is a factor a geologist would want to take a look at. The other key idea is porosity, and this one really allows for how much water can actually be in the ground. And so you're gonna take a look at what is the actual volume of void spaces. Uh, and you also wanna know the total volume. And when you divide those, you're ultimately gonna get a percentage and then you could figure out how much of underground can be filled with water. Now, there are some locations that have really rounded sands that are close 48%. So in other words, there's a tremendous amount of water locked up uh, beneath our surface. But it is also a valuable resource, and oftentimes uh, we tend to exploit valuable resources, and we, we will pump uh, way too much water. And uh, it's definitely things that are going to be coming to light in the future as different countries are vying for this uh, pretty important resource. Another topic that I want to talk about, because uh, maybe some of you actually live in Artesia, uh, but when groundwater gets sort of squeezed between layers, pressure builds up and the recharge area is at a higher elevation uh, than the area that's getting drilled. And so you drill down into it, water then would then come up to the surface. It's not like a geyser or a gusher, uh, a little bit shown like in the picture here, but uh, nonetheless in in our local Cerritos area, when you drill down, there are definitely some areas where you can have this uh, artesian formation. And that's ultimately how the city of Artesia got its name. The last topic that I'm gonna sort of describe a little bit is that groundwater in certain areas that have limestone as their bedrock can really eat away and dissolve the rock itself. And so the general area is called karst topography. A karst topographic area is gonna have a couple unique features. Uh, they're gonna have lots of sinkholes. Here's the sinkhole, there's the sinkhole. Uh, the sinkholes are from collapsed caverns underneath because again, the water has pooled and eaten away at the limestone bedrock. In the United States, uh, Florida has a lot of different uh, areas that are considered karst topography. Uh, different parts of China uh, have a tremendous amount of karst topography, but wherever you have limestone as your bedrock and more of a humid climate with lots of rain, you can have this karst, karst topography. Some of the really weird uh, topographic features, you've got these streams that all of a sudden are flowing and all of a sudden they disappear and they go underground. Uh, and then there'll be streams, there'll be sort of these a little bit of uh, canyons created by the eaten away uh, quickly of a river system. So this again is considered a karst topography. It's also an area that would definitely have interesting caves. So here's a picture of a cave and some of the features that you notice that uh, are unique. One, you've got these stalactites on the top and then you've got these stalagmites on the bottom. You've got some of these pillars. As water is percolating down from rains, uh, it's going to dissolve. And then once it hits this air of the cavern, it's going to precipitate out and create those unique structures. So again, the limestone is made out of calcium carbonate. Uh, and so then these structures that are built inside of the cave are also made out of uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, Arizona has uh, a couple really large and unique uh, cave systems that you could go and visit. Uh, Northern California uh, near Mount Shasta also has some caves. Uh, if you've never been to a cave, uh, put it on your bucket list uh, and, and go check them out. They're pretty incredible places to visit. So just to, as you, we're going to do an activity that's going to look at uh, topographic maps and some, again, the key features of karst areas are going to be lots of ponds, lots of sinkholes, uh, and possibly streams that disappear. So again, this is a picture of, Cal uh, of Florida, 
and you can see all of these are sinkhole ponds where the surface has collapsed and the groundwater is allowing uh, a pond to have formed. One last picture for you. Again, sinkholes can create a tremendous amount of damage and they're really hard to assess where they're located. Uh, you know, you've got your drill data um, and your you know, survey data, but again, these can form somewhat quickly. And again, they're hard to, to be able to recognize. So again, this is a classic example of a sinkhole. Uh, here in Southern California, every once in a while we'll have a sinkhole, but ultimately they are formed by a water main that breaks and then eats away at the ground underneath and then the hole then would collapse underneath it. So hopefully we learned something new about groundwater. Uh, we will um, talk about streams uh, coming up next.